Welcome back to Wood Engineering. I'm Jeff Orochko from Carleton University. And in this video, we're going to be talking about design of wood members in tension. And the most common way that we want to load wood members in tension, if I have my, you know, two by four here, is in tension parallel to grade, which as we discussed, if I'm pulling on this, as we discussed in the mechanics video, is one of the strongest ways to load a piece of wood. And so it looks like this. <clears throat> we have tension parallel to grain. Um, we also call that tension parallel. If we wanted to write it quicker, we might put parallel lines here, say tension parallel. And so we have a piece of wood here. Um, we have load on either side. Obviously those have to be in equal and opposite directions in order for the piece of wood to be in equilibrium. And I've kind of drawn what the grain looks like on the side. And it's just like when we see the side of a piece of wood like this. And you can see the grain lines um, on the side of the piece. And you can see it on all the sides. And that those straight lines indicate uh, the grain direction. If we look on the other uh, side, we have curved lines, right, which are the growth rings. So those are the perpendicular directions, as we talked about wood being modeled as an orthotropic material. In a previous video and those grain lines the grain direction always lines up with the longitudinal direction of the piece of wood so that's the long direction if this was the height and width of the cross section the other dimension of this piece of wood usually a piece of wood would be much longer than this obviously is the length direction and the longitudinal direction of the grain is lined up with the length direction of the piece of wood so if you want to figure out which way the grain direction is, which way the tension per, the tension parallel direction would be, it's always lined up with the length of the piece of wood. If I were to pull it in another way, then I would be pulling perpendicular to grain. So there's only one grain direction. So if I have three degrees of, um, not degrees of freedom, but if I have three axes, you know, one, two, and three out of the page, only one of those is the parallel direction. The other two out of page and vertical here are both perpendicular to grain directions. Okay, so sometimes I'll indicate the grain direction just for myself on a drawing by uh, drawing this kind of double arrow. And that's just kind of a reminder for myself which way the grain direction goes. But it's pretty easy to figure out as long as you can figure out what is the length dimension of the piece of wood. Okay, so this is a good way to load wood and we're gonna figure out how to do it according to um, CSA 086. Uh, which is the Canadian wood design standard. What about loading it in the other direction? What if I want to take this piece of wood and load it perpendicular to grain? Well, it turns out that, you know, as we talked about in wood mechanics, uh, this is a very undesirable way to load a piece of wood. Why? Because when we're loading this way, we're not loading the fibers, which are the strong part of the piece of wood. We're actually pulling the fibers apart. And the only thing holding the fiber the fibers together is the lignin in the kind of composite matrix that makes up a uh, wood material. And the lignin is comparatively quite weak. So this is actually the worst possible way that we could load a piece of wood is like this. You know, even if you take your nail and, um, and, and, uh, and pull it a little bit perpendicular to grain, you can easily pull off a piece just with your fingers, right? So obviously it's very weak. And it's so weak in fact, that we don't really have any design conditions where we would want to do this. Um, so they don't even, they don't give us a strength in the standard for, you know, how we would figure out the strength for that. The only exception to that is that sometimes we might have some types of connections, which would be undesirable types of connections, but we might run into those types of connections that load in that direction. And we have a splitting resistance for that. And we'll talk about that when we talk about connections. Okay, so what's the principle behind designing for tension? So if we think back to uh, one-dimensional mechanics um, way back, you'll remember, of course, that force equals a stress times an area, or equivalently that the stress, the definition of stress is force divided by area. So we had um, some symbols for these, obviously, sigma and A for area. So if I want to calculate the resistance of a piece of wood in terms of how much force can it resist, then my force T 
TR, for example, that's my tension resistance, and that would be a reduced resistance uh, in design, is the maximum stress that the piece of wood can take in that direction, in this case in tension, times the area. So this here is force resistance in tension. And this one here is a strength in terms of a failure stress. Okay, and then uh, recall as well, when we actually want to design um, and we're using a load resistance factor design, then we have a criteria for how much TR has to be. And TR has to be greater than or equal to TF, right? Where TR is the factored resistance and TF is the factored load effect. So the resistance part of that equation we get from our wood design standard or if we're designing in steel we get it from our steel design standard S16 in Canada or we get it from our concrete A23 and the other side of the equation, factored load effect, we get that from our building code, um, either uh, NBCC, usually if we're doing it at university, or if you're in practice, then you're using the, um, the provincial code that's appropriate. For example, the Ontario building code, which are largely similar to NBC in this respect. And the factored resistance we factored down to account for the fact that um, materials might not be as strong as we expect them to be because of um, material variability and reliability. And the, and the load effect, we factor up to account for the fact that we want to get kind of an upper bound of what kind of loads we can reasonably expect. And we talked about that a little bit when we talked about reliability. Okay, so uh, we will review that TF bit when we do some examples. But really here, we're more concerned about the resistance in this course. So how do we um, figure out what the tension resistance is? Okay, so what's our tension resistance parallel to grain? According to 086.14, which is the right now current version of the wood design standard, and uh, we're going to look at everything in this course from the point of view of lumber, and then again from the point of view of glue lamb. And that little uh, circle with the line through it is just indicating a section number. So when you go to refer to your own copy of the standard, you can go to clause 6.5.9, and that's where it gives all of these um, all of these things that I am uh, doing right now. So for lumber, we have a pretty simple equation. We start with tensile resistance because this is basically the simplest design case um, for wood. And we have a phi, capital FT, AN, and KZT. So this phi is, okay, so before I get to that, you know, you can see here that we have a similar uh, equation to what we had before, because before when we're talking about how this works, we have a stress max times an area, and you'll see here as well, um, we have a stress max, which is represented by FT, uh, multiplied by an area A, and then we have some other things that we're throwing in here. So the first thing that we're throwing in here is a resistance factor. We're adding a resistance factor to account for material variability. And um, we talked about that in terms of reliability. So this allows us to make sure that we're designing at a uniform level of hazard to what we design everything else for. This FT here is a maximum stress with a bunch of modifications. And in another video, we talked about what kind of modifications we have, um, load duration, system effect, treatment effect, and service condition accounting for moisture. Here for AN, we're considering a net area. Consider net area. And we're going to talk in detail about what that means. And in addition to the um, stress modifications in capital FT, 
we also have KZT, which is a size effect modifier. Now, if you want to know exactly what all of these terms are accounting for, just go back to the video where I talk about um, uh, force modification factors and where I give a detailed explanation of why we need to modify the strength by each of these different types of factors. Okay, so the phi is the easy part. So phi is 0 0.9 pre-calibrated for our convenience um, to account for material variability. So I just plug in 0 0.9 for that. Now FT, capital FT, this is kind of going to start a trend for you in timber design, which is that we always typically have a strength modified by a bunch of parameters in order to get kind of an effective strength. And so capital FT is small FT, small FT being my specified strength from the tables, times KD, times KH, times KST, times KT. And we're going to see this a lot. Basically, every time we do one of these equations, we're going to have an F something times KD times KH times KS times KT. So FT is my tension strength. From tables 6.3.1 A through D, if I'm talking about lumber, which we are right now, and these are all my modification factors. For duration, system effect, service condition, which is basically what is the moisture content of the piece of wood, and treatment whether I had to treat the piece of wood for, um, for moisture to prevent decay or for fire or something like that. Okay, so then the AN in that equation, as I said, is the net area of the cross-section, which I'm going to show in some detail in a little bit of the cross-section. And KZT is a size factor. From table 6.4.5. And we saw those size back factors before. So the KZ is Z indicates a size factor. T indicates that it's for tension, just like a little bit higher in the equation here. KST is a service condition factor. That's the S and the T stands for tension. So there's a different service condition factor for each uh, direction. So if I want to look at those tables, um, this is my table of specified strengths that we looked, let, that we looked at in the specified strengths um, um, uh, video. And so you see here we have FT tension parallel to grain. So depending on my grade category, this one happens to be for structural light framing, Depending on my grade category, my species, and my grade, I can pick out a appropriate FT value for me to put into this equation. And there's all four grade categories here. And then if I, when I want to get my service condition factor, I come to this table, table 6.4.2, where I have service condition factor. This is for lumber. We can tell that by the fact that this is in chapter six. For lumber, KST, service condition factor for tension, I can see it's either one if it's dry, or if it's wet, it's going to be 0.84 or one, depending on how big the piece of wood is. And if I want to look at size factor, then here I have, you see, KZT, which is size factor, that's the Z, for tension. I think Z kind of indicates uh, volume here, so that's why they use that for uh, size effect. So tension parallel to grain, and then I look at my smaller dimension, uh, sorry, no, in tension parallel, all I need to do is look at my larger dimension. So whatever is the largest dimension of the piece of wood, if it was something like this, the larger dimension is this dimension, which is 89 for a two by four. And I read across to KZT and I get 1.5 and that's what I plug into my equation. Okay, now what about the case for glue lamb? 
And for glue lamb, I'm going to go to a different clause. And glue lamb design is one of those cases where it is a little bit different for tension um, from lumber, but not a lot different. The idea is still basically the same. Here I have a TR, that's my tension resistance, equal to a minimum of two different parameters. So I'm taking like the lower bound of two different possible cases. One is phi FTN AN, which is just a resistance factor times a stress, a strength in terms of stress times a net area. The other one is phi, oops, F T G times a G, which is a gross area. That's the total area of the cross section. If, um, you know, if you've done steel design, you'd be familiar with um, checking tension strength for a gross section and, and checking it for a net section. So glue lamb, the way that the equations are set up, um, they have a different strength for, um, they have a different strength for the gross section area and they have a different strength for um, the net section area, which we're going to talk about a little bit more in a minute. So whichever I do both of those calculations and whichever one gives me the lowest number in terms of force, that's the one that I use for design. The phi is the same, 0 0.9, okay? And FTN and FTG follow a similar pattern to what they were in um, lumber. So I have big F TN equals small F TN, which is the number from the table, 7.3 times again, KD, KH, KST, KT. Wood design is really fun, but one of the things that you're definitely probably gonna get sick of is all these K this, K that, K that, K that. It's just the nature of the beast. So likewise for gross, we have large FTG equals small FTG, KD, KH, KST for tension, and KT. And in this case, these strengths come from table 7.3, which is the glue lamb strength table from table 7.3. Similarly to before, AN equals the net area of the cross section. And AG equals the gross area of the cross section. Okay, so you'll notice that there's no, um, there's no size effect factor here, like there was for uh, lumber. For lumber, we had uh, FTN, AN, uh, sorry, we had FT times AN times KZT. And here we don't have that KZT. So I'm going to put a little note here. Okay, so in glue lamb, there's not as much of a size effect in tension because it's made of smaller members. So that issue of um, not being able to see the inside and the grating being worse is not really present. But still, uh, experiments do show that there is some small size effect in tension. So for larger glue lamb members, the tension strength goes down a little bit. And that is taken straight into account just by reducing the strength FTG. But um, they also found that if they put the same reduction in strength for FTN for the net area, then it was really overkill because FTN already has a significant reduction um, to account for stress concentrations for when we cut cut little holes out to make our net area. So if we have to cut a bolt hole or something, then FTN already includes that reduction. So it doesn't add it to both. So that's kind of the reason why we have these two different checks. Um, and when I want to find my FTN and my FTG, I go to table 7.3 and you'll see here, this is just the top bit. I need to know my species and my grade. And then once I know my species and my grade, I just read down and we see here FTN, tension net section strength, FTG, gross strength. And so you see the FTG is reduced to account for this size effect already. And FTN is not, but FTN is gonna have a smaller area. 
So since this one has a smaller area and this one has a smaller strength, um, it's not clear necessarily which one is going to govern in all cases, depending on the relative reductions of the two. So in that case, um, we need to check both. And that's why there's a minimum of the two in that, uh, in that equation. Okay, so now the last question is, how do we calculate the net area? Okay, so why do we calculate a net area? The reason is because um, often in a piece of wood, in order to make connections, we have to make holes for bolts, or we have to cut notches in order to account, uh, account for geometry at a connection location, or we need to cut slots, or any number of things that we might do in order to change the geometry of the piece of wood at the end in order to allow us to make a connection. So here is a very simple case where we have a hole cut through the piece of uh, timber, uh, presumably to account for uh, having a bolt in there. And of course, when we remove the material by cutting the hole, now the amount of area available to take tension goes down. So, you know, I have my piece of wood, I cut a big hole here. Now the net area across the section where that hole is located is less than it was before. It's not this full face anymore. There's a hole cut in it. So we can't take into account the uh, the strength of the hole, basically, because the strength of the hole is zero. So if I were to look at a cross section of something like this, you know, I might have something that looks something like this. I'm looking at the cross section of a piece of wood. So I'm looking at it from the end. And let's say that I cut a hole in it. So at the cross section, the hole looks like this. And the amount of material that I have left is in this hatched region. So it has reduced. Um, if I do this as a numerical example, and I give some dimensions, let's say that this is a two by four, 38 millimeters by 84, 89, sorry, 89 millimeters. And let's say that I cut a hole here that was 15 millimeters wide. Um, to account for a bolt that's a little bit smaller than that. Okay, so if I want to calculate my gross area, gross area is just the entire area not including reduction for the hole. So gross area, AG, is just 38 millimeters times 89 millimeters in this case, and we get 33 82 millimeters squared, if we calculate that out. And then the net area in this case, we're going to account for the hole. So it's gonna be a n now for net area is 38 times 89. This is one way that I can go about calculating minus, so that's the whole area minus the cross-sectional area of the hole, which is 15, the diameter of the hole, times 38, the width of the piece. So it's basically the square bounded by those red lines. And then I get 2812 millimeters squared. Okay, so it's reduced relative to gross. And if I was designing a two by four, the only area that I use is my net area because that's the one that comes into play in the lumber tension strength. If I'm doing a piece of glue lamb and I do this calculation, I need both these numbers, the gross area for the gross area calculation and the net area for the net area calculation. Okay, now <clears throat> one important caveat here the net area must be at least 75% of the gross area. So AN has to be greater than or equal to 0.75 of AG. And if we don't have that, then we can't use that design. So it means that we can only cut out at most 25% of the cross section um, in order to account for uh, connections or bolts or um, cutting things away or, or anything like that. And that's a hard requirement. So for example, for our case here, this small example, so for example, um, above AN equals 2812 
over 3, 3, 8, 2 times AG equals 0 0.83 of AG. So it's okay. Okay, so it's 83%. So just cutting out that one bolt hole, um, you see I've reduced it. I've reduced my cross-sectional area by 17% uh, to get to the net area. So you can see that now if I tried to add another bolt hole of the same size at the same cross-sectional location, so if I had this piece and I put one bolt hole, it's okay. If I put two bolt holes along the same line, then that's not okay anymore. I've taken too much of the wood out. Okay, what happens if I don't satisfy this condition? Then I have to change the design. Okay, I can either change the arrangement of the bolts, I can space them out along the length instead of spacing them out across the width. So if I need two bolts to connect this piece of wood, instead of putting them here and here, I can put them here and then some way further down here, as long as I've um, adhered to my space requirements. If I'm using nails, then nails don't, um, don't cause a reduction in net area. So I don't have to worry about that for nails. I can put as many nails across here as I like, as long as I satisfy the spacing criteria for nail design. And same goes for timber rivets and truss plates, which we're not specifically going to talk about. But so for nails, timber rivets and truss plates, I don't have to reduce my cross-sectional area for AN. But for bolts, I definitely do. And then I have to make sure that I don't take out too much of the cross-section. That's it for design of tension for a lumber and glue lamp.